Hello everyone, this is Dr. Angela Lin. I'm the uh, co-director of the MGH Myrie Syndrome Clinic, and that's a picture of our main building behind me. Please allow me to share, to uh, go to the slides right now. My talk is entitled, Your Child or You Have Myrie Syndrome, Now What? Learning about this rare syndrome and creating a personal care team. It's not about the details, but sort of an overview. It may not work for you, but it's meant to provide you some guidance. 35 slides in 20 minutes, so I'm a fast talker. We'll discuss the importance of creating a medical health care plan, share ideas to do this, make it deliberate, create a team, your personalized team. Think of this as a pet talk, me as the coach, it's not a formal lecture. Work together to what I call surf this wave, roll with the challenges. There's some repetition and redundancy between my talk and others, but I think that's fine. I think it'll help. There is a pediatrician on our board named Dr. Matt Thompson, who has a talk about uh, the PCP perspective. So some of the people listening to me are rookies on a team. This is brand new. Then there are people out there who are like the pros. They could probably give this talk instead of me. But I do want to salute or just give some thought to people who aren't here. They may be just not ready to participate. And I also want to mention there are people who have been lost to remember them. So a diagnosis of Myrie syndrome can feel like a tidal wave. This is what people have told me. It's like a door slamming on your face. It's like a broken heart. For many people, it is a path that we take and we finally reach the needle in the haystack where it's like finding the missing piece to a puzzle. So before you get information from experts or a team, what do you do? Well, most people go out to the internet, right? And there is a good product called Gene Reviews. These are reviewed by peers, and I was one of the co-authors of the first one. There's something called OrphanNet. There is Nord. And there is, of course, the Myrie Syndrome Foundation that has uh, lots of these materials too. So Myrie Syndrome is a spectrum of features. Each person has some of the features. Most people have many. Some people probably feel like they have every feature. Every person is beautiful in my eyes and wonderfully unique like a snowflake. We don't know yet how to predict who has what, when, and where, and how. It's everybody's question for the future. We just can't answer it yet. So this is not about doctors talking down to patients and families. We're on a team. We all know our positions and we share them. And we try to make progress. So you're going to build a team. You probably hadn't thought of it that way, but you are actively going to build a team. It's based on your family doctor, your PCP pediatrician. There's going to be health maintenance, the usual stuff, weight, growth development, and vaccines. Make referral to specialists, care for common illnesses. Somebody has to be the healthcare coordinator. Will it be you? Do it yourself. Will it be your pediatrician or will it be somebody in a team like ours? By the way, we do have some uh, handouts on our website, including one that's called Introduction for the PCP. You can uh, access it, print it, and share it. Also in Spanish, and the Myrie Syndrome Foundation also has handouts too. So the PCP primary care physician is at the center, with the geneticist playing a strong role because this is a rare syndrome. And then we have heart doctors, lung doctors, physical therapists, orthopedic doctors, ENT doctors, what I call brain health, neuropsychology, therapies, and even psychiatry. And you may wonder, but gee, I have other problems. That's right. So skin, GI, vision, joints, brain and spine, um, urination, continence. So all these things play a role and they all have specialists. So my role is to be uh, a co-navigator to help guide your child or your family through this all. And this is a picture of our Myrie syndrome team at MGH. We have doctors in every specialty, cardiology, nephrology, scanning, pulmonology, medicine, et cetera. And we have both pediatric and adult specialists. It's nice. Um, and there are even more so as the need arises, you can meet some of these people. We also have a parent advocate. We have a close relationship with the Myrie syndrome foundation. And over the past, oh, I wanted to mention our research assistant, Eleanor Simone, who's been great. Uh, over seven years, we've seen 45 patients between the ages of two to uh, 50 plus. So it's uh, a big age span. And we have colleagues all over the world. We have a professional advisory board with colleagues in the United States and Europe. 
There are cardiogenetic clinics around the United States. They are not specific Myrie syndrome clinics, but they will see patients with Myrie syndrome. We have geneticists in Canada, the United States, uh, Europe, uh, Australia, and Asia. So we are building a network just week by week, month by month. I just want to say a few words about disclosing the diagnosis to the person with Myrie syndrome. There's a lot of flexibility, no wrong way or right way. I do advise that you avoid prolonged secrecy. Of course, this depends on the person's ability, the temperament, the curiosity, and how comfortable the family feels about discussing it. It's usually the parents, it's usually the family, sometimes it's the physician. And why disclose? You know, secrets are difficult to keep. No matter how hard we try, leaking can occur. There's also fears of the unknown, not just from my syndrome, but other disorders. People may wonder, is this like COVID? Did I catch it while I give it to my brothers or sisters? And when you do make the disclosure, you use words like difference, variation, atypical. We don't say abnormal. Stress support. You haven't changed. You're the same. And you can also say this might help all of us. So what tests do we do? So this is a model of Turner syndrome. It's another syndrome. We're not here yet. This is very detailed. It's based on a meeting that I attended in 2016. And we have different ages, different uh, organ systems, and we have evidence to back up what we do. So we're not there yet, but we're working towards that in Myrie syndrome. A practical substitute is gene reviews. You can just search on it, gene reviews Myrie syndrome. It was published in 2017, and I'm currently updating it for 2022. And it has a summary. It has suggestions about what to do. It's not evidence-based and it is already changing. So stay tuned. We think of care across the lifespan. Everybody's different from when they're a preschooler, adolescent, middle-aged or a senior. Our bodies change, growth changes, our lifestyle changes from being a, a child in a family to an adult to a, a senior too. When to test. Again, here's this idea of, of the lifespan. I'm going to show you this arrow over and over again. And so we talk about diagnosis at all age groups. Whenever we meet a person, we talk about the heart, airway, breathing, ears, growth. And then as people get older, we focus on some things. So we focus on elimination, poop and peeing when they're older. We talk about growth. We talk about school, behavior. Are there signs of autism? delays, premature puberty, and developmental delays are, they really occur in everybody with Myrie syndrome, sometimes just a little bit, sometimes more. By the time somebody's a senior, we're talking about things like arthritis, joints, a small risk of cancer, diabetes, liver, the quality of life, career, menstruation, puberty, work and independence, so things change. And even as I'm outlining though, to let you know, they may change over the next few years as we get more information. So let's start with the youngest possible person. That would be a fetus diagnosed prenatally. I myself has not cared for somebody, but I do know of this happening once. And so the role of a geneticist is to help the genetic counselor, the maternal fetal medicine specialist. The diagnosis is usually uh, made because of the suspicion um, of a small baby, short limbs, larger head, short neck, short fingers. That's just one possibility. And the findings that I've described are nonspecific. One can offer amniocentesis, but be, a, a, be aware, a chromosome analysis does not detect it. You have to do the high-end test that we call exome sequencing. And it is possible that a SMAD4 mutation, which is the gene, could be detected. We provide emotional support so that people can make the choice that they would like. So let's talk about people getting older. So let's talk about children, infants, and young children. And so the geneticist is there to help counsel, uh, help the pediatrician, help the family doctor, we talk about the heart, imaging the aorta. The cardiac surgeon might be needed for the few who do have something that's operable. There's constipation, breathing, vision, hearing, and this, is occur this occurs at every age. And so we're talking about children now. So what's different now? We're starting to think about their behavior and whether they can enter school. Not everybody can, but we try to. And whether they need the help from a counselor to talk about uh, possible autism, their quality of life, even ADHD. But these are the same, constipation, airway, vision, joints, speech. When somebody's a teenager, Ed, whether or not they have Myrie syndrome, the issues change, don't they? We worry a little bit more about socialization. Is it happening? Is there any bullying going on? 
talk about puberty. Is it coming on time? Is it premature? Which can happen in Myrie syndrome. And for young adults, there's something else. We have to transition. We have to go from pediatricians to internists. I know that doesn't happen in Europe. I'm aware of that. But again, I'm pre presenting a US model. And so we start to think again a little bit more about how the child that is now a young teen is adjusting to life and their peers. We keep continue to watch the heart, weight, uh, constipation, periods, vision, and hearing. So I talk about designing a fitness program. I don't tell my patients to go on a diet. So you have to think about nutrition. You really do. Some people are always thin, but uh, gaining weight is common in Myrie syndrome. We all have to avoid too much TV searching and computer time. We're all guilty. And when possible, walk, stairs. If you can, find some sports. Um, exercise, uh, uh, the Special Olympics. Remember to eat real food to uh, promote strong bones, avoid the junk food, and make this program a family focus. It's really hard if parents are really overweight and they're telling their child to be thinner. It has to be a family effort. So this is what I mean by transitioning to care. It's a deliberate process. Okay, I need to find some other doctors. We need to think about it. My child might go from a children's hospital to an adult one. And for, in the United States, some of these children at Children's Hospital can say they're till they're in their 20s or 23, but at some places it stops abruptly at 18. When you do find that adult provider, provide them with help, handouts, records, be the coach. So what about the senior years? Many of the same things, but now we're starting to think about uh, mental health, wellness, and joints, and weight, and liver. So these continue. So could one doctor perform all these, all these tasks? Could they take it on themselves? And I suppose they could, but it's a challenge. I find it a challenge as a specialist and I don't know how a pediatrician would do it. But there are some people in special countries, certain countries where this is done routinely. So Dr. Matt Thompson has prepared for you a talk about the role of the pediatrician. So I talk about equipment check, check. What does that mean? How are we going to communicate? How are you going to create this program? So for starters, when you're talking to me at Mass General, we have to do it in a secure way. Standard email, texting, we're not really allowed to do that. And I hate phone calls because we just end up playing phone tag. So we have something called a portal and it's called the patient gateway. It's similar in other hospitals. Because we use something called Epic, I'm allowed to view the records from outside hospitals. And that's really great. So what's low tech? Well, good old fashioned letters, faxing them, surface mail, putting it in an envelope, a phone call to your PCP or specialist. But you know, people are busy. It's hard to make sure everybody gets back uh, quickly. Get a calendar, not just the one in your phone. I advise getting something to hang in the kitchen, something large. Keep an address book. Use the cell phone camera to take pictures of your child or yourself to communicate. It can be a real asset. In addition to reading things quickly on your phone, like we all do, you gotta get access to a computer, a laptop, or a pad. You simply need to see the whole message because there can be attachments that we call PDFs. It's happened to me and it can happen to families too. Virtual visits, what we call telemedicine, it's done with a camera on the computer or handheld. And many of you already are familiar with this. Get a tape measure. I may ask you to measure somebody's head, their foot size, their height. And some people may need a home blood pressure monitor to monitor blood pressure. So you got to manage all this stuff. You have to create a system, folders, a box, a special drawer, an accordion folder. And I hate to be to intimidate you, but you really just have to. This is a complex disorder and it's going to be with you for life. So you just need to sort of get hold of it as soon as you can. Um, some people prefer to save their uh, reports to the cloud or to their computer in some way. Whatever you want, that's your choice. You got to share reports that you get from one provider with the other. Medication management can be helped by using a pharmacy. Remember to always check the label on your bottles to make sure you're getting the correct one. And when you contact your providers, as I said, try to use a secure email. This may seem unusual to some people, but it's the way, the best way to do it. So again, I mentioned saving to what I call your digital brain your storage place. It could be something called Dropbox or Google. I don't endorse any of these as a brand name. I'm just pointing out what's familiar. It's handy for people on the mood. So with all this work, take a time out. You're exhausted just listening to me. You have a lot of things to do and I appreciate that. And we all need a little bit of time for some fun. 
These are some of my patients who are definitely having a good time in different ways. But as one mother reminded me, she said, you know, Dr. Lynn, the parent of an extra needs child really never rests, especially if the child has extreme behavior, if it's a difficult time for them. And it, they, she said to me, it's a special form of exhaustion. You're never fully rested. So what are some tips? It's our job as providers, always remind the parents, you are not failing. I tell my parents, you are my heroes. I admire you. Listen, provide respite, find people to give them a break and ask how the patient is and the parent too. So there's a lot of frustrations with scheduling. You may burn out just listening. People say, I just get so tired of telling my story. So build your knowledge base, your own personal library with things I've mentioned either in paper or just have access to these uh, websites, the foundation, the clinic, NORD, genetics medline, gene reviews. And I know I'm talking fast. So you're gonna go back and review this talk and then uh, maybe check out some things. Uh, this M My Recino Foundation summer seminar series is great. You go back to it just the way you would go back to reading a book. And there will be individual articles that can be obtained from the internet at no charge. It's called open access. Generally, these are for, for physicians and kind of overwhelming for most families. And I want to celebrate some of the people that I've known. So share your story. I love reading about my patients and their families when they talk to me on YouTube in articles. It just gives me an insight of what is life all about. This is an article from a newspaper about one gentleman. This is another article uh, that a mother wrote about her and her child. These are stories on our website. We love to add them. And this is something also that was promoted by MGH. So there are lots of ways. Now you don't have to. Some people are very private. You're going to be weighing tons of choices, the problems, medications, if any, lifestyle, testing, personal beliefs, science, medical knowledge, short-term and long view. And of course, these are your choices. This is your body. This is your child. But I do hope you'll listen to me about some of them. When I advise you about certain medical things, do please listen. So to summarize, creating a Myrie syndrome healthcare plan is a terrific goal. It takes effort. It's worth the time. Different strokes for different folks. One side doesn't fit all. These are suggestions. Find out what works for you. Pay it forward. Once you figure it out, teach the next person, help me out, teach the next family. And in addition to clinical care, consider participating in research. If you visit us at Mass General or other centers around the world, I say, be part of the answer. You've got all these questions. How do I get the information? I have to look at people. We have to do what's called research. Sometimes it involves just talking, looking at data. Sometimes it involves blood. So some of the questions might be, what do people with Myrie syndrome look like? Now, when they're 10, 20, 30, or 40, are there more males? Does the specific mutation matter? Does anything predict the future? That's a big question. And here's a young lady that I know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is Myrie Syndrome and the foundation. So I want to thank you. Danke, merci, gracias, grazie. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you to the families who made this and future research possible. Our advisory board, the clinic team at Mass General, fund development who helps me raise funding to be able to do this and all the re referring physicians who've sent me patients and some of you are self-referrals. So thank you for listening.